It's Reality Check with Craig Price. I'm an idiot. Four minutes in and I'm already wrong. I'm like a monkey. Hello, look at me. Craig, shut up. Hey, I need you guys to do these things. (laughs) You're like a beautiful mind. I'm more like Forrest Gump. So... (laughs) Welcome to another Reality Check with Craig Price. Got a great show for you this week. Avish Parashar is joining me to talk about improv and improvisation skills and how we can use them in our daily lives and in our work lives. And he's also here because I have him on this particular week because I want to promote his speaking school, and it's called The Speaking School. You can go to thespeakingschool.com. He's got it coming up October 13th through the 16th in Las Vegas. He is putting on, uh, with Fred Gleek, he's putting on a four-day conference, so a little workshop situation. The first two days are going to be based just on the business of speaking. And then the second two days is on the craft of speaking. And that's why he's here. That's why I want him to bring on, because it is the craft of speaking that we're going to talk about today on the podcast. Improv is such an important part of speaking. It's reacting. It's being open to experiences. It's being open to what is happening around you, not just being locked in on your presentation. I, I used to start presentations and I we had a rigid structure and uh because I thought that's what you need to do as a speaker when I did stand up totally different story but when I was doing speaking when I just started I was the kind that was rehearsing and I was memorizing and the first couple times I did it I was horrible and so I, I threw that out as quickly as I could so thankfully I, I went against the the common theme of you got to know your stuff and rehearse your stuff and you have to have a speech and no, you need to know your topic, you need to know your information, and you've got to be able to bring your authenticity and your knowledge and your expertise and let that shine through. You get caught up in the script, so to speak, and things can get disastrous fairly quickly. So if you are a speaker or you're interested in being becoming a speaker, uh, you're aspiring to be a speaker, and you're free to go to Las Vegas October 13th to the 16th, go to thespeakingschool.com, take a look around. You won't be disappointed. So let me give you Avish Parashar. Like subconscious, they it's subconscious racism where they kind of say your name with a flourish, like oh, like the newscasters. Exactly, or they come and start talking to you about Indian stuff, like oh, great. <laughs> oh well, I don't India. Yeah, because you must know everything about India. Yes, exactly. Uh, and in fact, and I must care that you know an Indian person. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's the first thing they do is they yeah. they find something in common because I, yeah. I like for me uh, in my uh, condo complex we have a, an eighty some odd year old Indian couple. They're amazing. They're wonderful people. Ish and Bonzi, mm-hmm. and Ish uh, grew up on a mango farm. Nice. And one thing I learned about uh, Native Indians is uh, they love the bargain. They love haggling. They love the art of. They do. <laughs> and and I would take them to uh, the farmers market because I don't know a damn thing about fruit. Uh, and he'd walk me through and he'd grab fruit and and, and look at the the salesperson and go, "This is no good. How much?" And he and they'd be like. Whatever the price is, he goes. No, no, I can get this better. This is this is horrible. And he walk off, and he'd like insult people, and then he'd have me talk to the guy while he's rearranging cantaloupe. Oh, and... because you can. They don't want you to take all the like. It'll come in a box of four. Cause right. This is a fruit. They don't, but two of them are always bad, and they don't want you to get. Oh, so he's four... have you distract the guy while he makes a good box of cantaloupe. Yes, <laughs> he's but he's awesome because he and he talks about mangoes like the the, the mangoes in India's the mangoes in India's a hundred. No, no, thousand times better. <laughs> <laughs> thousand times better than here. They have Mexico's good, but India, <laughs> thousand times better. Oh my goodness! So, so people always relay those stories to you. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because because in Philadelphia, do they have a a, a large? Oh Indian yeah, population? yeah. There's lots of. Uh... I, I I've been to Philadelphia. I just know there's a lot of greasy people like me. Yes, well, you know, there's lots of all. It's a melting pot up there. It's, <laughs> it's a melting pot. It is a melting pot. And I'm here with uh, Avish Parashar. Did I yes. say that right? In a condescending tone? Yes, in the condescending flair, she said it right. So yes. Mean, parashar is fine. Parashar. I, I just, I, well, parashar. Look, parashar. I like to say with the flamboyance. Yes. Parashar. <laughs> but Avish Parashar is here. And I brought you on because you are an improv master. Uh, oh, well, thank oh, you. Well, I, I don't want people to think you're just some schmo I grabbed off the street. You're, yeah. you're, 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 you do this for a living. You show people yes. how to use improv. And, and I have a, a very weak, limited improv background. And I've always found improv very difficult mm-hmm. because, surprisingly, there are a lot of rules. Yeah. So, so tell me, what, where did you get your improv background, and how are you applying it today? 
Well, my improv background came, uh, like many things, when I was a young lad. And I had always did performing and stuff in high school. But when I went to college, I said, I'm going to focus on my studies because theater takes up too much time. So I dropped all performing. But then uh, I had this one friend who kept telling me I needed to try out for the improv group on campus. And well, I didn't really know what improv was at this point. And which campus was this? Uh, University of Pennsylvania. Oh, so you are you born and bred in... Uh... No, I grew up in upstate New York. Oh, and then, and then you moved then, down? Yeah, I went there for school. And now it's been about 20 years since I've been there. It's too long. Okay. Um, but yes, I, I I initially resisted and said, no, you know, it's not, you know, improv's not my thing. I've done theater, blah, blah, blah. And he basically forced me to go check the group out. And when I saw them, I'm like, oh, well, that looks like a lot of fun. And, and what was the name of the group? Because they're always fun, horrible names. Uh, this was, it was actually a decent name. It was Without a Net. Okay. So it's a, you know, it's a nice it, on point. It wasn't a... Some weird ones like the the, the, the poet killers or something yeah. like this. Or something <laughs> yeah, exactly, like exactly. Yeah. Um, so I auditioned for the group freshman year, got in, and uh, you know, thus was changed history, I guess. It's, so after college, you know, I was getting an engineering degree because I'm Indian, as we pointed out. Yeah, <laughs> and, and by law, you have to. Exactly. You Computer know, engineering, tried and true. Jewish people have to become lawyers and doctors and, and bankers yes. and, until they defi- find what they really want to do, but their parents push them in the yes, way. Yes, exactly. Indians, you know, it's acceptable to engineering or, or doctor. Um, oh, yeah. So yes, but I went the engineering route, which made my doctor dad very happy. Uh, yeah. but uh so in any case we uh you know i decided that uh, i started realizing i was really good at it and i had fun doing it and i didn't want to stop doing it so after uh, after college i started my own group in philadelphia with the dreams of turning it into like the second city of, of philadelphia yeah or the upright citizens brigade upright like... citizens brigade yeah whatever just an institution that's yeah. known beyond and, you know, and, what, and what'd you call it this is a weird name. This is Polywumpus. Yeah, see, I gotta. This is what I'm talking about. Yes. This is the improv people always come up with the. Oh man, the, we spent. We, I, I started with three friends of mine, and we spent um, literally days. I mean, we spent like whole rehearsals where all we did is brainstorm names and uh, focus yeah. groups. No focus. Yeah, groups. we didn't get the focus groups at the time, <laughs> and it was one of those names that uh, you know we all liked it, but when you say it the first few times to people and it's uncomfortable to you, like you feel almost embarrassed saying it. Polly like, Wumpus, weren't they in yeah. the Empire Strikes Back, weren't they? They're the ice creatures that... Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right, the <laughs> Polly Wumpus. <laughs> so, so, but, you know, then you got used to it, then we really liked it, so... Um, what kind of space did you guys have? Did you have your own space, or did you just kind of circulate? We did not. We circulated, and then we got kind of regular gigs, so we did uh, kind of at our height, which is, of course, right near the end. Uh, <laughs> we were doing... Uh, we had a theater downtown we'd perform at every Saturday night, oh, okay. um, a small, like, 100-seat theater, and then uh, a coffee shop in the suburbs that was set up for performance like it had a stage and they used to have music acts in there so every sunday night we performed there and so we're doing two regular shows a week we had about 15 members but it was one of those things where i'd been doing it for about seven or eight years and i said to myself i kind of stepped back and looked at it and was like you know i'm not sure what i want to do with my life anymore but this isn't it anymore plus a guy's got to eat the guy's got to eat yeah i mean through this time some i had jobs but then for a while i kind of made a go of just trying to do that which is uh very difficult. <laughs> yeah, no, I I had jobs and tried to stand up in New York uh, okay, yeah, exclusively. So you know. and, and when you try it exclusively, you realize that that's really yeah. you got to be really really on your game all the time. And even if you're really good, it can still be hard. Yeah, and you know, I'm not a I'm not a sales hustler, and I yeah. think the people that can make that work are the ones who can uh I mean, just beat the streets and get out there and, you know. Flyers. I'm an, I'm an artiste, you know. I, I can make people laugh. Oh, I'm not yeah. a sales guy. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not a sales guy either. And it's, I'm surprised every day of my life that I do as well as I do on the very limited yeah. sales ability I have. Yeah, um, and that's, you know, so that that was, it was time to move on from that. But through that, there was two reasons I decided to go into speaking. One is, as I was building that group, um, we had this big dream. So I started reading books on business and motivation, personal development, listening to speakers and so I started getting that inkling in my head that, you know, someday I want to do that. Anybody jump out at you that you really... Well, like many of us, I actually went to a Tony Robbins seminar. and uh, cause <laughs> How did you enjoy that? I actually enjoyed it a lot. Did you? I, I couldn't... loved it. Uh, I loved it. This uh, was, but this is, I mean, I'm talking, this is before I did any speaking business. Yeah, so. no, no. I, I went to see him before I was a yeah, speaker. You didn't and, like it? No, I hated it. I thought it was, I, it was like the worst possible. I couldn't believe people were <laughs> wasting their money because I felt... He was the cotton candy guy because he was—he uh, spent most of the time just screaming and yeah, getting us up yeah. on our chairs and and doing stuff. And I'm sitting there going, "What the hell is this?" Now some people respond to that. You thought it was great, and I'm not. Well, wrong I with that, I but. thought the experience was great. Um, I didn't have a, a break, life changing breakthrough uh, yeah. from it. Yeah. But the thing for me is, I also love teaching. So uh, what I loved at this time and, and still do is, uh, I was teaching improv, like if I taught a class or when I'd run workshops or rehearsals. Um, I also have a martial arts background, so I was teaching martial arts. Oh, so I'd be nice to school. you. Yeah, you better. Now, do you use the uh, the, the ancient Indian martial arts at the ones that I, I saw on, what was it, um, 
Oh, Ancient Warrior, where they have the... Yeah, I, I never know. Anytime, anytime anyone talks about Indian martial arts, I have no idea what they're talking about. So. They have some kind of weird, like, metal whip saw. Oh, I, I've, that sounds cool. I want to learn about that. It's amazing. <laughs> it's like, a, you know those saws that the like uh, lumberjacks use? They're, big, they're really long. Oh, like a band saw? Yeah, like a real band. But it was like, imagine that for just one person, a little skinnier, and they would whip it around. And, wow. And they could, no, was, I didn't know about that. No, I, they were crazy. I mean... No, I did really boring stuff then. So you just regular the regular stuff where regular, you, yeah, the Asian stuff. You just kind of oh, India is Asia, isn't it? Well, not according to, not according to most parlance. It's not. Oh, I thought it was in the when you call someone Asian, Asian, you uh, even though we are Asian. Yeah, see, I'm just yeah, but, I'm trying to be inclusive. Yes, good I'm job, the, <laughs> good job. I'm the Al Sharpton <laughs> of this group today, but it's like you know they they you are doing the like the. Regular taekwondo kind of stuff or black belt? Or yeah, like I did taekwondo, yeah, I did taekwondo in high school. I got a black belt in that. Then in college, I, I started over with a new style at college uh, called Ruku Kempo, which is Okinawan. It's kind of cool because you use pressure points and stuff. Um, Vulcan mind mill. Vulcan, yeah, we do all things. that jazz. Oh. And it was good. And But I, you know, it was funny because the reason I wanted to get my black belt, especially in college, I mean, I already got a black belt in, um, in high school, so I kind of accomplished that. So the reason I wanted to get the black belt was because once you got the black belt, you could teach. And so my senior year, we wanted to teach the class. Uh, so I did that, and then when I stayed in Philly afterwards, I kept training with the class and kept teaching. So, like, I loved teaching, and I loved performing. And when I saw that Tony Robbins seminar, I looked at what he was doing. I'm like, that's all he's doing. He's performing, but he's also adding that that teaching component to it. And, 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 and yeah, you, I think you need the entertainment value, otherwise people fall asleep. Yeah, and, that, and that's why I realized why he takes the two things I really love doing, and he's combining them. And so that's when I think I got the first inkling that that's something I'd want to do someday. Uh, and so when I decided to close up shop with the improv group, uh, I had already started doing some team building workshops using improv. And so I, you know, the improv group it was time to close. It and I said, well, I always said someday I'd want to be a speaker. So why not today? Yeah. I guess go for it. Yeah. Which was really stupid. Cause at this point I had no money saved up, no clients, no prospects, no leads, uh, and it, no experience. Yeah. I was going to say no, and no credibility, <laughs> no, credibility. No, no background. <laughs> yeah. So, and, uh, that was a fun year. <laughs> that was a, that was a fun year. That was well. I, and I've already established that I'm not a sales hustler. So. And I'm sure your parents are proud. Yes, uh, yes. They weren't devastated at the. Yeah, I think actually, um, I I think my my dad at least was a little happy. I mean, they were actually always very supportive. Being even the Indian, they're very traditional, but they kept surprising me along the way. Every time I thought they'd get mad at me or tell me I was crazy, you know, they were always very supportive. They just wanted me to be happy. They wanted me to be successful. You know, they didn't like it when I was doing it and struggling for money. Right. Um. So I think my my dad at least saw more potential in the speaking training business than he did in the improv comedy business yes because there is no there is no potential. <laughs> no but then, well there is and here's you know it's, it's like the lottery though it's like acting it's it, you if you're doing improv you know what are the odds you're going to get on someplace that will well, be some exposure to get you to higher levels and you know if i may get personal for a moment uh one of you yeah, know what are you going to say about yeah, me yeah one of the things that uh, i talk about with improv is how you know, improv is all about being in the moment and so in my keynotes when i want to talk about life as a series of moments and we talk about improv not having a future. I realize there's one real moment I look back on. You know, you always have those moments where you wonder what if. And so the one moment that I still wonder what if is after college, I had the decision to start my own improv group. Or I was thinking about moving to Chicago, which is kind of the second main, cities up yeah, there. Second city. And, uh, you know, I had actually auditioned for Second City. I didn't get in, but I got a letter, which was semi form But it was like, you know, you have improv experience. Uh, but, you know, some people just aren't familiar with the Chicago style of improv. So we suggest you take this accelerated improv class with us. But I was in Philly, and I'm like, well, do I move to Chicago? And so I decided instead of that route that I would start my own group because that also fed my ego more than taking a class from somebody else. Um, so we talk about there being no future in improv. I mean, a lot of the people who are making it big in, in entertainment came through an improv comedy group like Second City or Grand right. Wings. And, and so that's one of those moments where I'm like, you know, if I really wanted to pursue improv full time, should I have uh, you know, gone back or you know, would I have been better off going that route? Yeah, but the percentage-wise is what I was referring to because, yeah, there's a lot of, like, Amy Poehler and uh, who came from uh, Upright yeah. Citizens Brigade. There's a lot of people who came from improv, but there's also a lot Thousands, more people yeah. who are not making it. Right. Um, and it's I think it's a great tool, and, and that's I think that's what is yeah. what you do is you show improv as a tool for anybody in any business. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of what that then translated into is my speaking business became showing groups how they can use improv to – uh, you know, started with more team building, and then it morphed into uh, teaching creativity and communication skills, uh, which it still is now. But now it's a lot of you know, how do you react to change in the moment immediately? Yeah, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about because I think that is the most valuable part of improv. Um, yeah. Like like Toastmasters, I'm not a I'm not a big proponent of Toastmasters as a professional speaking uh, avenue. Yeah, it's much better for 
I have no problems with it as a – if you are a bank president or you are an executive who has to give presentations, to go to Toastmasters and learn how to speak, that's awesome and it's amazing and it's a great place for you. Yeah. I just don't think it's a great place for someone who wants to become a professional speaker because I believe they have such a rigid – yeah. It's they kind of suck out your personality. It's more of a, a a machine where they teach you a certain technique and yeah, the and ums and the ahs are gone. Yeah, it's a good it's a good place to start. Like well, I did Toastmasters and yeah, it did no. help me with my ahs and ums and helped me I didn't even know this, but I used to sway. Like I yeah, I used to kind of shift side to side. Um so those two things. Nobody likes me with. a shifty Indian. No, no one likes a shifty Indian <laughs> at all. That's that's but um bum. No, but that, I mean <laughs> So yeah, but I agree that uh it gets a little it does get a little rigid, and there's I don't always agree uh, with everything I read in the manuals when they give you instructions. Right. Uh, so, but it's a good place to start. No, like it's you definitely said, great. Yeah, and if you're an employee or something, yeah. But it's great if you're, especially if you're not ever going to go to a major platform. And you ju- it's just for work. Yeah, I really think it is very beneficial. But like I said, I I can when I listen to the presentations of other speakers, mm-hmm. I can tell within about a minute who's gone to Toastmasters and who hasn't. Yeah. Because they have a cadence, they've got a a, a a certain sound. Some of the some of the more the ones that adhere more to the rules, right? Um, well, you know, one of the sub niches I do is I use uh, I do a variety of things where I use improv comedy to teach presentation skills. Uh, and one of the reasons is that you know with improv because it's in the moment with no script, it, it really becomes so authentic. Like whatever you're saying is you. That's coming from you. And you know, a funny story is I was doing one workshop um, and. Uh, we had this woman. I was doing it with a with a partner. Uh, actually, it's uh, Kirsten Carey, who I think you're gonna. Oh yeah, talk she's to gonna be on the show. Well. She's great. So, um, we had this woman talking, and literally, she looked like she was in pain when she was doing her her sample thing because she had her arms fixed at her side, and then they'd start to move off of her side, and then she like slapped them back down. And this happened like three or four times before we stopped her and said, "Have you ever taken a speech class or coaching where they told you not to use your hands when you talk?" She's like, "Yes." I'm like, "Okay." ignore that like throw that away just relax and be yourself and it happened she came out so much more naturally and you know to your point about toastmaster teaching techniques i have a problem with any um any speaking presentation skills training that really i, I just don't believe in absolutes right. i think it. so yeah, it's like that's... when someone says don't move your hands like well you know yeah you don't want to necessarily distract by throwing your hands all over the place oh, the, but... like the ricky bobby where he's like i don't know what to do with my hands yeah, exactly. in the interview. <laughs> yeah. that kind of thing yeah, so and that's what I love about improv is that it's uh it's very individual based and it's it's not about and you can see the people who struggle are the ones who are trying to, to they're trying I guess to do something as opposed to just letting it flow naturally. Yeah, because I, I, one of the things that I found because I was a comedian that was thrust into improv for a brief time, mm-hmm. so I had a working for myself kind of situation. Now I'm working on a team, yeah. you know, and I've always had the problem with the the great. Yes, and because I'm more of a no but yep, kind of person, yep, mm-hmm. and um, which can work as long as you know it doesn't always have to be yes and yes and yes and every once in a while you can throw in a no but as long as it's super funny. And then yeah. they can because then you can just go and then the, the other person can respond by you know reacting to whatever they just said. The audience laughs and then continuing on with the yes and it's kind of like a hiccup. Yeah, well, that's one of those things. Like until you master the form, you you shouldn't break it. So some well, people start breaking it right out of the gate. I didn't have any. They didn't give me any <laughs> rules. They threw me up on stage and oh, did that. So. Well, it's funny you say that because you know, over years of running this group, we had auditions, and so there be people who come in and they either be very funny with their friends or they've done stand up, and they were almost always the worst improvisers. Yeah, because like you said, they didn't understand the team aspect, and they'd always go for the joke as opposed to building that that scene or that moving things forward. And it, it really, I don't think people who have only done one or haven't done either, don't understand that it's, it's two completely different mindsets stand up at improv. Well, I, I was telling you that the, I always see it as the difference between improv and ad-libbing. It's, it's, people think of it as the same thing, like, oh, he was, he was improving up there. No, no, he was ad-libbing. He was just saying things that came off the yeah. top of his head with absolutely no, no... And that's usually one or two words or a couple words. It's not right. a full on, I'm trying to progress the scene. Improv is trying to move everything forward. Ad-lib is just... Hey, look at me, and then move on. Yeah, improv's like, oh, here's a funny, or ad lib is like, here's a funny thought, or something. Yeah, you know, somebody in the audience says something, so I quip right back. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you move back. Yeah, and improv is. I mean, I guess if we're talking pure definition, you know, ad libbing is, I guess, a subset of improv. Well, it, you definitely use ad libbing in improv, but yeah. improv's definitely much more yeah, was more, more involved. Yeah. So, uh, well, oh, 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 nice. That's all right. Uh, hey, I, let me do that again. <laughs> yeah, just knock the microphone yeah. all over the place. <laughs> So uh, to go back to your point from, I don't know, 15 minutes ago. No, I had no point. When, when we got off on this uh, discussion was about, um, I think you said improv has a series of rules, and, and 
things like that. So there are, but what I what I do now and um, what I like to think of that is less rules and more as reflexes. You know, one of the most common things people would say to me after an improv show uh, was sadly not, um, hey, you want to go home with me? But <laughs> Well, those guys, you just got to say, you know. Yeah, I know. It's like, no, Don't, sir. Sorry. I, it's all right. I mean, sometimes that's okay. Yeah. Especially in Philadelphia. Yeah, but it's shocking how bad of a tool improv is to pick up women. I don't know. And that's why I hear, like, <laughs> I always hear, oh, I got into comedy because I wanted to impress women. Wow. You know, women like to hear comedy. They don't like to sleep with comedy. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I had a friend who said, you know, the difference between a comedian and a, and, a, and a rock star or a guy in a band is like, you know, when you, um, when you, when a girl sees you in a band, they come and be like, oh, hi, I thought you were really great. This is my friend Candy. We want to go home with you tonight. But when they see an improv comedy show, like, oh, wow, we thought you were great. This is my husband Tom. We had a nice night. Yes, that's <laughs> like, right. Come yeah. on. <laughs> oh, the married women come out of the woodwork for oh, improv. Oh, yeah, I love you. I love you. Um, yeah, so that, uh, that doesn't work. But uh, so, you know, people would say, the real thing people would say to me often is, oh, I can never do that. And uh, depending on how in-depth of a conversation I wanted to have at that moment, uh, you know, sometimes I just say, oh, well, you know, thank you. It's, you know. But really, the real answer is that, yeah, anyone can do it. Uh, and people yeah. like to say that, no. And the reason I say anyone can do it is, A, I've, I've trained a lot of people from, you know, ground zero to, to getting very good at it. And B is that it's just a series of reflexes. It's just, uh, you know, when the unexpected happens or when, you know, you have to say the next line in a scene, uh, you know, you can call them rules, and they are. They're kind of structures. And how do you respond in a way that's going to move things forward, uh, you know, and work together and make each other look good? And just like any other reflex, once you train those, improv becomes ridiculously easy. Like, for me, it's so much easier to improvise than to do stand-up. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's that I, it was always easier for me to – and I don't mean improvise, but it was always easier for me to get off my material yeah. and interact with the audience than it was to do my act. Yeah. Uh, in fact, that's how, you know, I, I was known for – jumping off my material as quickly as possible right so you're opening and then you're i had a couple jokes and then i hey hopefully somebody says something or something happens and then i would immediately because my add would go over and talk to them and do that thing and it'd be funny and then whatever and then i had uh, oh i got the light which tells me to get off stage yeah. and i would do my uh clothes yeah and so you had your framework but everything else you're just kind of ad-libbing or ripping off of people and that's right and uh i actually still kind of do that in my talks now well, so there you go see it's uh but once, but you know, like you've probably seen speakers who are newer, and uh, you know they have their speech written out oh, word yeah. for word, and they want to memorize the heck out of it. I'm like, that makes it so much harder, um, especially once you've got some of that improv, some of those basic improv skills down, because you just understand how to how to flow and keep moving forward, and it gives you the confidence to get off script or not not obsess about memorizing it. Because the problem when you memorize is if you forget one thing or say one thing wrong, you're off. You're yeah. just thrown completely. Yeah, and so how. Give me an ex an idea of an exercise, not necessarily a full fledged exercise, but some idea, some some things you can do to make yourself more accessible in the moment, um, to be more, you know, because you say that there's there's these structures in place, mm -hmm. but you got somebody who's a bank president and you want to bring him in and talk to him about you know being to relax more, be open in the moment. Yeah. Is there certain things that you can do? Not necessarily at games with people. I don't expect you to be whose line is it anyways. Yeah. But I mean, is there certain things that a person can do by themselves just to get into the situation where they get their minds a little more open to yeah those stuff yeah it's uh well i mean when i do presentations i do play games with well sure uh, sure but i mean that's but yeah but so but they got to go home and and yeah not necessarily have a chance to work with their improv yeah and team. so we give them ways of thinking and one of the big ones and this actually ties together the improv background and the martial arts background uh, i used to drive my improv group crazy because i'd come into like rehearsal each week and i'd have like some new crazy idea that i pulled from you know martial arts or somewhere so one of the ones is about this kind of the Zen empty minded type mindset, which is, you know, being willing to let go of all your direction for a moment. And what I mean by that is so here there's a there's a quote. I went to a martial arts seminar and this guy who was a really amazing martial artist. Anthony since, Robbins. Yes, it was Anthony Robbins. He, he he's got some kind of black belt, I think. He's but, he's buff too. I mean Yeah, he's, yeah. And he's like eight feet ten inches tall. No, he's like big <laughs> they shaved Bigfoot down and he's yeah. and he's now out there yeah. making everybody's lives better. Exactly. Well, you never know. He's a Yeti. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it could be. There you go. <laughs> so no, he said this line to me. He said, you know, um, he said you can't sneak up on a mirror, and, and that was it. it was you know, very cryptic, very like very old. He's not, he wasn't like an old Asian dude, but that's very old Asian. Old dude, Zen like, thing. Yeah, yeah. And it took me a long time to figure out what the heck he was talking you, about. Like sneak up on a mirror. Yeah. And so what I realized is that this whole idea of being in the moment is that when you, you know, when you've got a lot of thoughts in your head. So, for example, if you're walking down the street and your head is filled with thoughts, someone can walk right up in front of you and you won't even know it till you know, they bump into you. 
Um, but a mirror is completely empty. So the minute you look into it, you immediately see yourself back. And so that's the same mentality I brought to improv. And that's the same mentality. If you want to improvise in business, it's the same thing. It's, it's being willing to what I call have an empty mind. And I know is, a lot of uh, CEOs. Yes, exactly. That are, that are completely empty. <laughs> it's to get rid of the thoughts that are going on in your head. You can hear the wind whistle. You have one ear right out the other. Yeah, they're empty. <laughs> and um, so, you know, one of the problems is that one of the things that improvisers struggle with is when they have a preset idea of where they want to go down the road. And that always happens to people like, oh, I know where the scene is going or I know where I want this game to go. And that is always less entertaining than when they just let go of those ideas and just stay in the moment. So it's those thoughts. So when you start obsessing over the future, it's this idea of gently pushing those thoughts aside and, and, and just focusing back here and, and now. And how can we do that? G- give me a technique that I can do. Is, is, do I like, close my eyes and constantly think of just one thing or not think of anything? Or what's a, a good well, technique? Well, the simplest technique is one I got when I did a... a <laughs> severe blow to the head? I don't yeah. know. You know. It's, uh, it's a technique I call the, the, the pause-breathe technique, the PBT technique. Um, and I got this actually when I was doing an anti-bullying program for elementary schools. Uh, and they show it's just a matter of, you know, it's, it's controlling that initial, um, initial response to go empty. So it is, you know, before you respond, uh, pause, you know, catch yourself before you say something stupid or, you know, or hit someone or whatever, take one or two breaths and then think about, okay, what's the big picture? And it sounds really simple, but that's really what, what improv is, especially when we're talking about life. It's just pause, breathe and think. And then that gives you, in a lot of ways, what I realized, what this must be sound like is it's the reverse of improv, because I'm also telling you not to knee-jerk response. But it kind of gets you in that improv mindset where you access your creativity, and now you have options, yeah. um, as opposed to just going back to whatever your default was going to be beforehand, which, you know, when something unexpected happens, your original plan may not be valid anymore anyways. And, and that's what I, when I learned fairly quickly, uh, seeing enough improv, is that they're not really... I mean, a lot of times they are coming up with new stuff, but mm-hmm. it's not necessarily new. It's being open to allow you to access the Rolodex of things. Because if you do the same kind of scenes over and over again, say you work for Comedy Sports, which is a major yeah. group, and every Friday you're doing something, and then they go, well, I have a policeman with he works at a real estate agent who it likes coffee. And so they do the scene, and something funny comes out. Yeah. Well, the next week... That if, if the coffee comes up, but everything else is different, they may be able to uh, adapt. It's like uh, it's finding well, the, the the yes and no. Because I've seen I've seen yeah. some guy do the same thing over and over again. Well, over here's a the period thing. of time. Here's the thing: is that um, yes, that happens. I mm. don't think that's the best improv. Um, and in fact, I know when I used to do improv, I used to hate it when we get the same suggestions because yeah. uh, my mind works in a way where I don't want to repeat, but my mind goes to what I did before. So it makes it, it's like I have to work two or three times as hard because I still want to keep coming up with new stuff. And it's funny you brought up uh, comedy sports because they, they have a lot more structure in their improv than a yeah. lot of other improv groups do. And what I realized about it is, is their structure pretty much guarantees them a pretty solid show every time. Right. It kind of, the, the, the worst a show can be is at a pretty high level. But in my experience, that also means that it lowers the potential for the show as well. So you're always going to get your the delta of your shows quality is always going to be in this small range, which means it's, it's never going to be a bad show. But, but it's I think never going to be never, a great show either. Yeah, I mean it'll be great in one way, it'll be funny, but you're never going to get those moments of brilliance. And you know, so I would pride myself and used to work in the group on not you know going to that rolodex in terms of reusing a joke, reusing a line. You know, we'd reuse characters or an accent, you know, because obviously that's you know, but you put the character in a different situation. Um, and it just it always felt it stunted the creativity when you would when you would go to the because really I think the reason improv works because here's the funny thing is I realized early on is when I did try to redo a joke uh, it would get a much less response from the audience yeah I I have that problem in general just when I like I'll I'll be talking to a group and something will fly out of my mouth which tends to happen almost uh-huh. every time and it's good and I try to recreate that at, at the next show or the next presentation. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't come out as good because, or even in my own brain, I, I end up rephrasing it just slightly, and it's just that little slight variation that dulls it to some degree. You know what I mean? Yeah. It came out sharp that first time, and it cut real deep, and it was funny, and people liked it, and then the next time, eh, not so much. Yeah. Uh, only because I said it a little differently, because I, I, I guess I was trying too hard. Like you were saying, you don't want to try to push something to a conclusion. You want right. to be open. Right, yeah, and it's, you know, I think, um, I spent a lot of time thinking about over the years, like, why improv? 
Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you that when like, you first walked in, but I thought that was rude. <laughs> yeah, what the heck's wrong with you? No, well, like, why Why does someone Why does someone go to an improv show instead of a sketch comedy show? Where with sketch comedy, you've Usually had they, time they're to... brought there by the improv people. Yeah, like, hey, make this good. <laughs> I got a cousin. I got to go. <laughs> he wants me to go see the show. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, with sketch comedy, in theory, they've had time to work it out. There's mm-hmm. a higher production value. They've edit it in theory so in theory um yeah there's been some bad sketch comedy as well because i gotta fill you know i got 20 good minutes but yeah. i gotta fill an hour yeah i've been in a lot of that so it's okay <laughs> i've been in a lot of that bad sketch comedy <laughs> so the thing i think uh, you know the, the reason improv is that you're there's something just i don't know if it's impressive or engaging about being in the presence of creation you know it's like you know when that joke just came out of your mouth right there and the audience can like you know everyone like you're startled the audience is startled just, and it Things rocket off in a new direction. It's brilliant. And I was talking about this with Scott McCain about speaking. Um, you know, we were talking about we we got on a tangent about comedy and doing stand up, and you know, people being a little aggressive and uh, at the comedy versus at a business situation, mm-hmm. they're not going to be. And I he asked me why he thinks that is, and I my personal belief is just what you said. They're going to witness something that they know at that moment nobody else will ever see again. Yeah, because they only the people in the room have witnessed this brilliant comeback or uh, this comedian defend himself or put somebody down right. or whatever. But And I think that's what they want, and I think a lot of audiences want that now. A lot of business audiences, they don't want the insult. They don't want the you know yeah. guy you know nailing a heckler so bad. But they want to see something that they know they wouldn't have seen unless they had come to the meeting. Right, and, and that's – you know when you talk about the heckler, you know, when I talk about something going wrong, one of the things is that it's um, – as much as it sucks, uh, it's also your opportunity for your your biggest triumph, you know. Because you know, if you think of like customer service, if you think back to your customer, your best customer service experiences, you you appreciate the ones where everything goes right. But when you think about the ones that stand out, it's probably something went really wrong. Oh sure. And someone stepped in and just shined and hit a home run and made it all right and made it all better. So when you look at the unexpected, and that's what it is in improv, when things, you know, the people who don't perform well. On stage are the ones who they have that kind of preset idea, but when something really random happens, whether it's themselves or a performer or the audience, all they're trying to do is like they get freaked out because now their plan is thrown and they're just trying to get back to their plan. I'm just trying to survive at that point. And it's like, no, you gotta like one of the funniest things. One of my my best. This is in my co- no. This is whatever. It was in my. It was in Polly Wampus. But we were doing a show and uh, there was a little alcohol involved. This is one of these like private type shows where uh, this is for my old fraternity and we we did this like once a year. It was a lot of fun. And we're doing a game where, like, two people are acting out a scene and two people are sitting in chairs kind of controlling it, saying, let's cut to this scene, cut to this scene. And at some point, some dude, like, in the front row just stands up, walks, like, directly across the stage, not even trying to, like, hunch over or be quick, like, to go to the bathroom. And, you know, everyone's like, what the hell just happened? Why did he do that? And so, of course, the people controlling this scene said, you know, the entire thing morphed from whatever the heck was going on in the scene to this guy's life. Like, it became cut to this guy here, cut to this guy in the bathroom, cut to this guy, you know, later on with his girlfriend, you know, because he was sitting with the girl. And, like, the audience died. We had fun. And that's, like, a simple example of, you know, turning into the curve. It's something went wrong, and, you know, you don't gloss it over, and you don't be like, oh, okay, how do we get back to our plan? It's like, no, you know, let's use this now. And that was, like, one of the most memorable things we've done just because it was, you know. And like you said, it's never going to happen again. If we tried to recreate that, you know, you put a plant in the audience to walk out or you. Yeah. And, they can, and they can feel uh, they can feel inauthentic things happening. They can, yeah. Tell, I mean, unless you have a, a superb actor, uh, uh, two superb actors, one reacting, yeah. one in, in the plant. Th- there's always that feel because it's like out of the blue, someone asked a random, very specific question that yeah. didn't seem to fit with all the other questions that have been going on. It's just like, and then everybody's like, "Who is that person?" And then I, you I can feel tell. Like, I feel like I've heard a speaker at one point say that they all have a plant to like drop a plate or something. Because they have such a great line for it. I'm like, really? Are you kidding me? Like, that's is that what we're doing now? Yeah. That, well, someone's doing that. No, not you. I know you wouldn't do that because I, I can I can see in your face when you brought it up. Yeah, how disappointed like, you were. Oh, it's like really. It's and just it's, it's 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 sad, but it's also one of those things where if something does actually happen, yeah. If something happens, you can't just ignore it because everybody in the room is thinking about it. You've yeah. got to address it just to get their attention back because if you just ignore it, you just leave that loud noise, The uh, something happened or an alarm went off or something happened. People are like – they're still kind of like, what happened there? What was going on? 
they're not paying attention. You go, yeah. oh yeah, and you make a joke about the lights. Uh, I don't know if you saw Jimmy Pardo last night. I didn't. I had to miss that. Uh, he was great. He the first five minutes he talked about how well lit. The conference room was because normally <laughs> you, dark, huh? he's yeah he's like let's not let's put us someplace that has the bu- the brightest audience we can see the audience no matter what a little dark on stage really bright in the audience <laughs> he's, he's really he did five minutes on that because you had to address it yeah because yeah. he knew he was walking into an environment that is wasn't best for him yeah. and and he has to snap them out of going wow I can see everybody uh, right so they can laugh right you know I learned that in in high school my high school theater director. One of her rules, she'd say, like, you know, before opening night, every play was if you drop something, if you drop something, pick it up. Like, if, if a prop falls, because she's like, until you pick that prop up, that's all the audience can focus on. It's the exact same thing, you know, if the lights are off, if something goes wrong, you know, you gotta, you have to address it. But it's funny, though, you mentioned the acting thing, and, you know, people talk about whether or not, why they should script or not. And I'm like, you know, the reason actors, especially like the Broadway ones, get paid well because they're able to do the same thing every single night and make it look like it's totally fresh every single time. Well, right. That's the talent coming through. I yeah, think and think... the work, right? You have to rehearse so hard to get to that point. Like, those lines. Mm-hmm. You know, people who are like, oh, well, the Broadway guy's like, yeah, but you rehearsed that that bit like three times. It's not going to be the same yeah. as the guy who spent six weeks in rehearsals, you know, to yeah. get to that point. Um, and so if you're just reusing a line, it's going to seem inauthentic unless you got it so practiced. Which at that point you gotta ask yourself, what am I doing as a speaker? <laughs> like, well, I mean, some people really like the fact that they're. I mean, it all depends on their personality. Some people really like the crafting of words, yeah, and so they don't mind doing that. Me, I personally, I have a hard time just editing a blog post because oh, yeah, I put it out there and uh, I'm done. Yeah. But it, you know, can someone at least proofread it? Because I'm not the best. <laughs> but I have a hard time going back to uh, edit things. Yeah, only because I feel like once it's out, it's. It's done. I don't. So when I do my presentation, I personally put stuff in so I can wander around, yeah. without feeling trapped. Right. Because, um, because like you said, you don't want to be doing the same exact thing every time because it gets boring to, to to you. And if you're bored, right, right. Well, what's funny though is like my stories within my keynotes. Well, that's different. Are practiced. Right. Um. But yeah, I'm not gonna like I'm not gonna pretend to be spontaneous. And yeah. And and you know what it comes down to is when you when you go to that Rolodex like you're talking about or when you pull an old joke or you know, try to recreate the magic from before, to me what that is is a lack of self-trust. Like in my head, I know that I'll be able to be that brilliant again, that I don't need to pull an old joke because by trusting my creativity and spontaneity that w- I'll come up with something in that moment. Now that takes practice to get to that level of comfort where you're like, whatever happens, I'll make it work. But you know, especially if you're an improviser, that's why I don't like improvisers who don't do that because I'm like, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing? Well, I mean, You're not improvising at this point. Yeah. yeah, like, and it's so much more fun, like, because it's it's fun for me to create. You know, that's what makes it fun for me as a performer. It's not to go out. I mean, I love making the audience laugh. And, you know, I'm telling a story, but what jazzes me at improv is when I do something, I look back, I'm like, wow, that was awesome. Like, I don't know where that came from, but it was brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Well, for uh, we got a couple minutes left All here, right. and I really appreciate your time. And in if there's one thing you could, uh, you know, that we haven't already discussed, the one thing you could talk to somebody who. Maybe is in a situation where they don't have the outgoing personality, because mm-hmm. um, that's one of the great things. If you can, if you have an outgoing personality, improv is a little easier for you. Yeah, because like one of the things I tell people is, uh, uh, people are afraid of speaking because they're afraid of looking stupid. Yeah, that's the number. What's the main reason why people don't like to speak? Right. Like I that. lost that. I don't. I don't mind looking stupid. I do it pretty much every day, <laughs> and I've learned to accept the fact that you know looking stupid isn't so bad because it's no big. Uh, half these people will never see me again. Yeah. Um, and but also I also know I'm not stupid inside. Uh, I just did something stupid in the moment. Yeah. Um, but if that one person who maybe not so as outgoing, maybe a little more introverted, um, is there something that they can do to access that moment a little more? Besides the we got the Zen part, so we're gonna yeah. we're gonna breathe, which uh, you know we do. Um, yeah. Well, most of us, the ones who haven't, have died. Yes. Uh, at least but after about five minutes. But that's a really good. That's actually a really good technique. But what else? Give me uh, something else they can do to access the moment. Um. So you mean to stay. Well, let's do the, mo- to stay present in the moment or to take advantage of the moment. Well, since we talked about staying in the moment with the breathing, mm-hmm. uh, ac- well, let's go about accessing opportunity in the moment. Okay. Well, this comes way back to a, a line you briefly mentioned, which is the primary improv principle of saying yes and, uh, as opposed to yes but. And, I still I say no but well, yes, or no but. wait. Well, actually, no <laughs> no but is better than yes but, right? Because no is I no but I'm gonna give you an alternative. Um, and when we talk about that, so saying yes and is exactly what it means when when presented with anything. You say yes and. Now, it's not literal. It doesn't mean that no matter what you say, I'm always going to say yes and. 
Uh, so you know, the joke I make in, in my speeches is if office slacker comes to you and says, hey, I haven't worked on this project. Can you do it for me? You don't say yes and let me pick up your dry cleaning too. Like you don't just go out and become a, a doormat. But what it means is we're talking about in the moment. So what is your thought process? And so many people, their initial thought process is whenever anything new happens, it's no. And now you have to convince me to say yes. And so what I encourage people to do is flip it and think yes. So if you come to me, like when you came to me for this thing and said, let's do this interview, initially it's like, yeah. Well, I know that with improv guys, they're all going to say yes yeah. and. Now, we may step back then and then think through. What the hell did I get into? Yeah, well, you think through yes and. Now, you don't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily commit to it out loud right away. Yeah. So it's a thought process. So to take advantage of the moment is catch yourself. You'll be, once you start being aware, you'll be shocked at how often, and by you, I'm talking to you, the listener, um, is, is how often you yes but yourself and how often you yes but other people. Whether it's literally saying yes but or saying no or just saying yes and but meaning yes but. Uh, and that's, I mean, those are the people who miss out on all the opportunities because you got, yes, and is a little bit riskier. So what I encourage people to do is first notice when you're saying yes, but the next stage is start thinking yes, and, and the third stage is to then say yes, and, and see what happens. And just by doing that little, I mean, that's probably the most powerful. In fact, that's a, that is a new book I'm working on, uh, is all about saying yes, and how to do it and how to take advantage of it. Well, I certainly appreciate your time. Where can people find you on the on the World Wide Web as it is? On the World Wide Web, I will send you to two places. There's my humor blog called MotivationalSmartAss.com. Which I appreciate that name. That was I, I like people who are taking risks. Yes. In well, our business, you. politically correct <laughs> is a little too hard yeah. for them. So I liked when I saw that, I guess about two, a year or two, yeah, two ago. Two, two years ago. Two years ago, ago yeah. yeah. You, I went, oh, I wish I had done that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I really enjoy that. That's a lot of fun. That's, that's what I call personal development for people with a sense of humor. So uh, check that out. And if you uh, want just more, sh- if, you're, if you're offended by the smart ass, then uh, you can go to avishp.com and that'll redirect you to Avish Parsh. So you don't have to spell it. So uh, avishp.com or motivationalsmartass.com. You get more information about me. Well, if there's one thing I know, you are a smart ass in, in the Absolutely. best possible way. <laughs> thank you very much. You got it. Thank you, Craig. I want to thank Avish for coming on the show. Again, that is thespeakingschool.com, October 13th to the 16th in Las Vegas. Check it out. If you're looking to become a speaker, it's something really worth investing your time and energy into. Also, you can find us at realitycheckpodcast.com and now on YouTube. If you if you look for Reality Check Podcast, that is the handle. You can now subscribe to the channel and get the podcast through YouTube. Have a great week. Hey.